Welcome everyone here and at home to the May 23rd Eugene City Council work session. Uh, the first item we have up on our work session tonight are items of interest and committee reports. Um, so we have three committee reports, and I don't know that we have a whole lot to say about any of these. Maybe um, Makes sense. more on the wastewater one, I don't know. But um, I'll try to do both, give you each a chance to talk about things that are important to you, but we want to get on to the uh, uh, meeting of the, of, about the auditor's report around 6, so we want to stay on time. Um, so my uh, committee report is on the Chamber of Commerce, and I just have a couple comments to make. I'm meeting with them tomorrow morning, actually, so I don't have anything really new. Um, I did meet with their leadership to talk about how we can uh, work together to boost our economic development. You know that they're participating with us in the um, Envision Eugene and, and in supporting the MX. You know that they helped with our uh, Honor Guard Fund for helping with the uh, memorial for Officer Kilcullen. And um, those are kind of the, the things that are have been part of the discussion um, recently. And um, I guess I could add that I got some uh, thanks from the Springfield Chamber for participating in the ACE Awards and, uh, and congratulations for the work we're doing downtown. So I guess I'm hearing from, uh, from both chambers, so that's good. Um, just really briefly, we had last week a uh, We Gene celebration celebrating our neighborhood associations and giving neighborhood awards. Uh, we had a kite festival, Asian kite festival over the weekend. We had an HIV Alliance walk that I participated in. I get got to be one of the people to choose Miss Whitaker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Who is? <laughs> um, a fashionista. Uh, and uh, we, there was a big yard sale in Whitaker, 35 uh, different homes participated and they all got maps and people went all over the neighborhood. Um, uh, public Works had their Public Works Day. Our fleet was awarded for their good environmental practices and got recognized for that. We got to do the um, start of building the Willa Kenzie Crossing, which you'll probably hear more about from somebody else tonight. And today at noon, we did the topping off ceremony for the Inn at Fifth, which was just really um, great to see that um, coming in to be. So lots of, lots of things going on in our community. Um, so I'm just going to start with Betty and we'll go around. Thank you. Well, I did attend the topping off ceremony, which mm -hmm. was exciting mm -hmm. to sign my name on the whatever that thing is. <laughs> this the thing beam? Is. Yep. The beam, yes. Um, workforce Partnership is, like many other groups, is having big budget problems. They're doing good work, but they are probably going to have to have fewer employees and do few and to help fewer people retrain, help fewer young people find jobs. They're still doing the same work, but there's a big big problem with money, which is something new. And that's about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alan? When I first got on the council, the mayor told me that uh, uh, one piece of advice that I remembered ever since, which was no issue in Eugene really ever dies. Mm -hmm. I think that's really true. And uh, so I've been working over the last week with uh, a group of people led by Rick Wright of the Market of Choice to pull together a new proposal for Safe Civic Stadium that involves both the Y and um, <coughs> uh, Safe Civic Stadium folks to come to a combined proposal to present to the 4J board uh, as an alternative with Rick Wright's financial backing. And uh, so I'll be actually leaving in a couple of minutes to go say a few comments to the 4J school board, but I'll come back. And uh, more details to follow on this one. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> ah. Thank you. Um, just oh, one, one more thing. Sorry, I handed out the Fairmont Neighborhood History Project who won a Eugene Award. Um, there's some really cool stuff in there. The one, the one thing in particular that's really cool to me is the uh, there's a map of the old trolley system that used to run in Eugene, um, and uh, it's kind of fun to look at. And uh, and if you didn't know. Fairmount was actually an incorporated city for two years. 
and was, before I read was that annexed into the city of Eugene. So it's the only city that's been annexed into the, by the city of Eugene. <laughs> um, but it would have been a very small little city. But mm -hmm. so it's got it's got a lot of character and a lot of uh, uh, charm to that neighborhood. So uh, uh, that's what this history project's about. Going back and studying that. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Cat. This is really good. <laughs> yeah, the I'm people who did it work on it just did an amazing job. A yeah. lot, a lot of work. And it's um, uh, oh, uh, matching grant, neighborhood matching mm -hmm. grant funded this project. Okay. Uh, and that was worth butting into my time for. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is really good. I, I loved looking at the old pictures of uh, Eugene and Skinner Butte before there were trees. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, lots of trees. It's an amazing yeah. thing, trees grow in Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, just one thing that I have from Bethel, uh, the Bethel Park sp scoping project is underway, and we had a meeting out at, uh, out at um, uh, this, uh, Bellevue School last week uh, to talk about the potential of a YMCA at Bethel Park. For you all who don't know, Bethel Park is the new park out there by Meadowview School, which has four baseball fields, wonderful skateboard park, uh, just a really nicely done park, um, well used, and uh, the YMCA is uh, considering options of building a community center YMCA there. Uh, there'll be a lot of uh, lot of opportunity for people to weigh in on that, both from inside and outside of Bethel as the process moves along. And it's certainly not a given that it's going to happen, but it is an exciting prospect and something that we're looking forward to talking about. Can, and I, can I ask you a question on yes. that? So that Y proposal is on park property? It is on city property, yes. Uh, the the uh, It's not finalized that exactly where the footprint would lay and where the parking would <coughs> lay, but uh, it is on city park property that would be leased to the YMCA, is my understanding, uh, through the city. Very interesting. The, uh, the original proposal for the park was to build a community center <coughs> at some point out there, but we're 20 or more years away probably from being able to fund a city-sponsored community center. So this moves things a little bit closer to the front burner. But the neighbors will have a chance to weigh in on, for instance, uh, traffic congestion or traffic flow that may, may um, be, be involved in the, in the development. But really, it's a pretty exciting prospect, and I hope lots of people weigh in on it. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the work that you and your staff have done in bringing that forward. George. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is remind people in the Harlow Neighborhood Association area that there's a meeting Thursday night, the 26th, from 6 until 8 at the North Park Community Church. And so on the Harlow Road, I believe it's net right near Sweet Gum Lane. Uh, the other thing is uh, I did attend the groundbreaking ceremony for the Willow Kenzie Crossing. I went by there this evening, and they're actually heavy equipment moving dirt out there. So it's, it's coming right along. You know, there's a lot of different people involved in the organizations involved in making this come about. Um, it's affordable housing, and I can't remember the total number of units, but they're going to incorporate 16 units for developmentally disabled people to actually move into their own place and be able 60. to, yeah, 60 plus total units. Um, they're also going to have a community center inside of there, and they're incorporating a lot of their design to reflect some of the history. And if you look at the drawings that they've got up and, and of the Willa Kinsey Grange, it's kind of the same window patterns and things. So it's really going to be a really nice project when it gets done. And then the other thing is, is I did go to the Public Works Day after the groundbreaking ceremony last Thursday, and there were hundreds, literally hundreds of little kids everywhere. And it's, if you've never been to one of those, you need to go. It's really kind of a fun thing just to wander around and watch all the activity. And, uh, you know, the, the kids are just absolutely in awe of some of the uh, equipment and, you know, that the city uses for the, the different, uh, uh, different departments. So I did go to that, and that was kind of a, kind of a fun thing to, to walk around. I think I've made all but one since I've been on the council. So next year, put it on your calendars. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I, I really haven't been attending too much of my other obligations. Budget committee just is, took a lot out of us, John. And I'm going to be actually leaving at 6.30 to go to Bethel's um, budget message tonight. But I did want to invite all of you and any of the other elected officials. June 4th is We Are Bethel. And I've um, procured a table for us to be at. And it has to be an interactive table because it's all about interacting with kids and education. So um, if you have any ideas <coughs> on how to make that happen. Um, let me know but uh, you know that it goes from noon to five I think and so you're all welcome to come out and just check it out and see what's going on and I think we're together at the mm -hmm. booth aren't we absolutely 
Mike? We had a police commission meeting this last week, but I'll have that this uh, next council meeting as a fuller report. Uh, we'll probably have some of the materials that were presented to the full police commission for all of you as well. I'm working on that right now. Chris? Uh, thank you. Um, first thing I wanted to acknowledge uh, the election that occurred last Tuesday um, for. You know uh, something about that? Huh? <laughs> a little bit of interest in that. Um, and congratulations to those that got elected. Uh, congratulations to those measures that passed. And um, it was... Uh, and Chris's wife getting elected. Yes. yes. Just, just, a, Small just a part of it. Yes. Just a part of it. A modest um, 70%. Also wanted to mention that the uh, Evaluation Committee for the Housing Policy Board is meeting um, tomorrow to uh, take a look at the uh, proposals or to take a look at the standards for the proposals for the next round of housing um, uh, that will be approved. In fact, the project that George went to today was a Housing Policy Board funded project a couple of years ago, and so it's great to see uh, that these things actually come to, to fruition and that we actually do fund these low income projects, and it, it really is a great project. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is um, how glad uh, and pleased I was that we made it through another budget process, and we did it in. Um, it, was, it was tough, it was a hard slog, but we made it through, and I want to congratulate everybody that worked on it. I think it was not an easy process but that we made it through, and I um, am glad that we did it as, as well as we did. Um, so thanks to everybody for getting through a budget. George? Um, well, um, part of what I'm really about the only thing I have to report from the Metropolitan Wastewater Commission you already know about if you read the packet, and it's about the last month we approved a month and a half ago, actually, we approved a rate increase of 4% for the regional um, wastewater fee, monthly fee, that for the average household equals about 83 cents a month, a fairly modest increase. It allows the, the, um, all the projects to go forward in a timely fashion and maintains the bond rating, which is real important. Um, so even with the local, the local rate is going to go up too, 3%. Which is 28 cents a month, but even even with those increases, Eugene's still fairly it's still fairly reasonable fee um, of 31.26 a month for all the wastewater services, as opposed to 40 dollars and 81 cents a month for Springfield. So, um, and otherwise, I went. That's about all I have for them. We'll we'll be asked tonight for to uh, ratify their budget too in our council meeting. Um, and I went to McKenzie. Watershed Council meeting, but I'll save that for next time and okay. get a report on that. That's all about right. it. All right. Thank you all very much. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Just a couple of really quick things. One, uh, I also want to thank the Budget Committee for uh, their work this year. That's always, uh, um, it's always nice to see all of you, of course, volunteering and putting your time into it, but also the community members that are willing to spend really quite a bit of their time. Uh, working through what is a absolutely critical uh, kinds of things in this community. So I really appreciate their work as well and just uh, express my gratitude for that. Uh, the 3rd of June, several of you have signed up for the Brava Breakfast, which is the ABAE uh, breakfast. If you're still interested or haven't had a chance to let us know that you'd like to attend, please uh, do so and we'll ensure that you are uh, have a ticket in reserve for that. <clears throat> On the 31st, uh, EPD will have their annual employee awards. That was uh, previously scheduled. That happened during that time when uh, we're planning for the memorial. And um, so please join us for that. And um, the 22nd of June, Summer in the City starts already. So uh, keep that on your calendar Wednesday evenings. Uh, that's going to be a uh, significant. Check it out uh, on Eugene Gogo, right? On Eugene Gogo, -Go. <laughs> if you don't, have, if you haven't a chance to take a look at that, I would encourage you yeah, to do I'm that. Signed up, definitely uh, do that. And uh, a lot of road work this summer, which is also really a positive uh, thing that's going on. And uh, I walked by the Bennett project today, and boy, just <laughs> lots of work going on down down there in what used to be one of our pits. So. Um, Nice to see. So, Lake uh, Charnelton is no longer there, huh? What's that? <coughs> Lake Charnelton is no longer there? No, you know, they're putting in form, I putting mean, in concrete. They're, yeah. Yeah. It's great. They're, they're working fast. Pits in order. Yeah, 
Our that's kids nice. Are, are filling up fast. Yeah, it's and good to see. Yeah. I would <laughs> just add one more thing before we move into our next uh, agenda item, which I didn't mention because a lot of you know Charles Martinez and you know how much work he's done on diversity and equity in our community, and he is moving out of that position. There was a gathering for him. Um, last week to recognize what he's given to the university and to the community and he's going back into his teaching and research work I'm sure he'll keep doing good things in the in the community but I I went and spoke on our behalf of, uh, of our you. appreciation for his work in in our community so I didn't I thought I should mention that. All right. So now we're going to move on into our even a little early, 15 minutes oh, early. <laughs> don't have to fill the yep. <laughs> This is the work session item on the, the report to City Council from our police auditor. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it's nice to be back here. Um, John told me I don't need to use all my time, so I won't. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please stop me. Let me know. I have a little uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. There are some additional <coughs> slides that I added. This is what happens when you have three and a half hour layovers in airports. <laughs> is you decide that you ought to be doing something useful. I know, I know. So, um, so I added a couple slides just to kind of summarize um, some of the things that we studied. Um, one of the things, of course, we study was the number of use of control reports that's what they call them in the police department I, I call them use of force reports this is where they're normally engaged in some sort of um, fit, uh, more physical activity with officers use of tasers um, uh, wrestling matches those sorts of things and so of those there was of, of all the arrests and citations 99.2 percent uh, did not generate a use of control report so out of 14,600 and change only 119 of those uh, occurred and um, I think that's a very good number I, I I try to do some statistical comparisons it's not always easy uh, because everybody does reports differently but I think that that's a very good number I think a number that's very important as well for us is the average turnover time for <coughs> internal re affairs reports from the time we get the complaint until the time um, that the chief does his adjudication decision is 79 days I haven't been involved in this field for 20 some years one of the biggest problems that agencies have had is the amount of time it takes to get these investigations completed places like San Francisco and Washington DC have experienced years in which it's taken cases to get disposed of. Uh, when I started in Cincinnati in 1986, uh, on my desk were cases from 1982. And so uh, this is a very significant number and, and really um, a, a good performance by the folks in internal affairs to get these things turned over quickly. And also a recognition of resource management to have uh, the resources available to do that. Uh, the average turnover time uh, for service complaints is 23 days, which again is a very good number. That's where person complains. We classify it as a service complaint. It goes to a sergeant who then contacts the complaint, talks to the officer, contacts the complainant again, and that turnover time is 23 days. So I think that that's a very good number. Um, of the service complaints, 62% uh, are satisfied with the outcome. 76% either agree or somewhat agree that the sergeant dealt with the issue appropriately. We talked about having a mediation program here and um, <coughs> that has not got sea legs yet because of some interpretations but I think what we've established here is a mediation program with our sergeants that is not labeled a mediation program. Uh, Denver which is supposedly the um, um, pinnacle of mediation programs, if you will, um, their satisfaction rate on outcomes is 62 percent, and their satisfaction rate on agree or somewhat agree that the mediation addressed what they did was 76 percent, which is identical to our statistics on the sergeants dealing with these service complaints. So uh, we have a mediation program, I think, that 
is not called that, and I think it's working out really well, and I really appreciate the sergeants um, taking the effort to interact with folks and the officers and get back to folks. I know it takes a lot of time. It's not your typical cops and robbers sort of policing, but I think it's done a, a very good job of addressing a lot of these complaints. And I'm, I'm, I, I was surprised by the number, quite honestly, when we when we looked at that. Now we've only we we've got about a 20 percent return on our survey, so it's not an extraordinary number. But 20 percent on male surveys is actually a pretty good number. So um, I, I'm satisfied with that. Another statistic that I think's important, and it and it's hard to. Um, qualify perhaps is the 27 percent sustain rate uh, if if people are thinking that we're letting things go I think that that disputes that fact um, and I and I put some comparisons in there as well from the smaller cities like Boise to Los Angeles which gets about 9,000 complaints a year I can't imagine managing that um, so I think that what we're doing is we're identifying issues in performance and behavior and we're sustaining those at a pretty high rate now my hope is and my expectation is that that number will start to fall because we're clear about our expectations and again a lot of those are internally generated the thing that might skewer that though is that we're now looking into the people who work in communications section once we've read through the ordinance and things like that we actually have responsibility for for those kind of complaints those are typically internally generated um, and we've had discussions with uh, the bargaining units for those and at least the leadership of the EPEA is appreciative of the fact that we're looking at those things now rather than supervisors because uh, I think they think that we we have a more balanced approach so some of those things are sort of pre-identified if you send a sheriff deputy to the wrong uh, address or you send a Springfield officer to a sheriff deputy's responsibility those kinds of things and, and some more serious things of just the wrong level of response for a particular incident so we'll see how that plays out uh, clearly since it's a new development for those employees and makes them nervous uh, but um, again we just try to address them as, as best as possible uh, for the next slide another thing that I added in again with all my layover time uh, just I know that tasers are a big issue in Eugene and so um, I started to look into uh, taser use per 10,000 in other cities and again sometimes it's hard to find the data sometimes you have to go to taser international which is usually favorable in terms of their data for for tasers so this is what I would consider for, the, for at least half those cases favorable data and our taser uses were 20 in 2010 24 in 2009 so for 2010 that averaged 1.3 times per 10,000 residents and as you can see the other numbers it's not till you really get to Canada um, <laughs> that you see num numbers that are that are similar to Eugene so even places like Cedar Rapids Iowa which I think is still there after the tornadoes um, uh, significantly higher a uh, small county like Putnam County Florida which has a population of about 70,000 people was 6.4 so I did it a lot I try to do a, a variation of different cities and things to get the numbers and it shows I think that uh, they're rarely used in Eugene comparatively speaking um, and so if I can find a city that is about our size that has a less number I'll get it to you but so far I haven't been able to do that so I wanted to point that out because I know tasers are uh, an important issue to our community lower than Victoria lower than Victoria I know which is a pretty peaceful place last time I checked um, I've been there for a while but uh, it is. <laughs> for us I internally um, we're gonna return about 12 percent of our budget uh, to the general fund the reason for that partly is that we had a vacancy and I partly hesit or hesitated or was more deliberate in filling that vacancy because I knew that we needed some catch up on training and I knew that when I was going to bring a person in um, that we were going to have to get some extensive training because there were, there's all kinds of new training out there um, 
uh, and uh, like the use of force institute and and catching up on the legal issues that are out there because of all the court decisions so those kind of play together but we're still going to probably return close to fifty thousand dollars of our budget back to the general fund i'm not going to spend it just because it's there i appreciate that john and his staff are um uh, willing to provide funds for me to operate the office office effectively and that um, he trusts us not to spend it um, in a in a less than um, accountable manner and, and I do appreciate that another thing I think that that just uh, has been great and Lee is in the back row is is hiring Leah pitcher Lee is just done a fabulous job in so many ways all these charts and graphs instead of all the verbiage was uh, mostly if not all Leah's work and Vicki's work I just really have an outstanding staff of two people and it's just great to have a great team uh, on board again this year we intake I think about 310 or 12 complaints last year was about 308 so we're about the same uh, things that I um, paid a lot of attention to in terms of the big issues, uh, which I think attract outside attention, are the search and seizure issues. And we're still having some debates about that. But as you saw uh, Saturday night before they went in on a minor in possession, loud, or, uh, loud party thing at the university area, they went and got a search warrant first. Yeah. And I was, uh, apologize for the judge if they woke him up. Uh, but it's something that we've advocated for even the court even though the courts have given a lot of leeways in different areas this makes it clear to the officers and makes it clear to us what the expectations are it's a little more work uh, but I think it's worth it uh, to go about it that way uh, vehicle pursuits as you, you'll see in a, uh, a graph down the road a little bit are down I I don't like vehicle pursuits in general um, 300 people a year are killed in vehicle pursuits in this country and a hundred of those are innocent people so when there is a vehicle pursuit we do take a careful look at it and we do analyze it because it is a business decision that they make that is high risk and so we want to make sure that when they do make that business decision that it's high risk on behalf of the organization that it's a good and sound decision and that they have the training to be able to do those kinds of things because we had some issues where we just didn't think that that was the appropriate thing to do as you saw in the reports uh, again use of the K-9 teams, uh, I think uh, there was a time fairly recently where things weren't as tight as they needed to be, and so we've firmed some of those things up, and then um, processes for officer-involved shootings. We're blessed because they're so rare, and we're cursed from an operational standpoint because they're so rare. And so when they happen and there's a lot of adrenaline involved, uh, some of the operational aspects post shooting need to get better and so we've been <coughs> addressing those things uh, I'll be issuing a report on them actually uh, and I've already conveyed to the chief uh, what my issues are on some of those things uh, I don't ambush them at the end if something comes up during a process that I think needs to be corrected or needs to be improved I immediately address that with the chief and the management of the organization let them know that I'm going to address that and give them the opportunity to, to, to correct things so I think we're going to see a more incident command system type of of ICS and I know Chris is familiar with it working with the Red Cross one of the, one of the things that Homeland Security actually designed pretty well um, and we're going to see more of that and try to massage that within the legislation that the state had passed years ago so those are some things that we've uh, addressed this year this is the the first thing that came to my mind on this thing was the <laughs> smoke monster from lost uh, if any of you watched lost um, we have a complicated complaint process <laughs> and when Leah did this um, I no one was more surprised than I was and I think she did a great job identifying what the flow chart is for our complaints I think it shows that we do an awful lot of work on complaints um, and I think more importantly uh, 
I'm not sure if it was the vision of council at the time that there were going to be a lot of decision points during this process but there's a lot of decision points in this process and I don't think I think that if you don't have the right people in the right places making these decisions we start running into problems mm -hmm. and sometimes it seems like an awful lot of people feel that they ought to weigh in on how I classify complaints no one probably dislikes it more than I do but the fact of the matter is it's probably the best system that we have if we start changing those kinds of things what we're going to end up is that 79 days you saw is going to stretch and decisions on cases are going to take an awful lot longer so when I looked at this um, I, again no one was more shocked than me but I think it also shows that we have a very thorough system and that we do take our complaints seriously and we do contemplate them and we are willing to change our minds if if things shift but um, this is really explains all the work that everybody did to set up um, our organization and the other organizations and I think it works pretty well as complicated as it looks at times yeah it's really stuck in the hip rotating around <laughs> I know because things change and so if a, for example a prosecutor says no this case shouldn't go forward then it goes back up into a classification and through an administrative process and then there's more decisions as we go down until we get to closed and even when it's closed it's not closed uh, because then you have to talk to try to talk to the complaint and it also might be heard by the CRB and so then all of your decisions above the CRB review has has the potential of getting panned by the CRB and we have a very vigorous and hard-working CRB and sometimes those decisions are panned um, but it really is um, uh, quite a dynamic model that we have here and I think it works pretty well actually she did one that was sideways and actually looked a little bit better but this is the one we had for our report um, these are our complaints uh, by classification over the last three years uh, we've seen uh, a de decrease of allegations of misconduct uh, I think the major reason for that is that we triage them more if you will um, sometimes when something just doesn't sound, sound right to me I'll ask for the in-car video and the audio and that's helpful for me uh, sometimes we get the reports so I think before uh, some of those things weren't looked at uh, as um, uh, looked at at the at the early stages because I don't want to overburden <coughs> internal affairs because I love the 79 day number and getting these complaints turned over the old saying justice delayed is justice denied I want to make sure that people uh, get their answers fairly quickly uh, po policy complaints there's an increase in that because I think there's also the decrease in the allegations of misconduct where sometimes someone complains about something the officer did but it really it was a, a policy issue not what the officer did and so those things have gone up and I, I suppose that they'll probably go up a little bit more um, and then that's where we get into the police commission kind of things we're still sort of we still haven't got to 100 percent where I'd like to be on the search and seizure issues so sometimes we still get those policy things rather than identifying a particular officer for causing the problem it was probably more the policy uh, service complaints are uh, about the same uh, people in uh, Eugene are vigorous about their police force and and how they um, behave and so we hear from those folks a lot and um, I suspect we'll continue to do so now the uh, complaints by by month uh, Leah did was um, just a little bit more uh, complicated it was hard to come up with a good design for the graph for this quite honestly uh, but you see we peak sort of actually we kind of peak in the spring when we don't really get great spring weather here in Eugene and um, and then in the summertime when we get a lot of transients and students that like to spend the summer in Eugene is we'll have a little bit more uh, on the complaint side so uh, it's not anything that we had um, expected then in August people kind of move on and um, so things are um, decreased a little bit I, I'm certain this summer that we're going to have more complaints because of the manpower increases downtown. 
uh, in the efforts uh, in terms of having more bike officers and more downtown officers. Uh, I, I would expect that that would increase. But on average, we're, aver we're getting about 27 complaints a month. <coughs> Uh, by classification, these are just the cases, uh, conduct, conformance to law, um, use of force. Uh, we had 14 complaints about that. Uh, Ten were performance. Some of these are internally generated complaints. And so um, it's not anything that, there's nothing there that jumps out at me, quite honestly. Um, the criminal conduct allegations were both unfounded. Um, we take those very seriously because of things in the past and even if there seems to be no merit or factual basis um, those are sent to uh, usually uh, Oregon State Patrol to look into so uh, we want to make sure that we cover um, uh, all the issues that a person brings forward and um, both of those that were unfounded uh, this was a chart of our all the allegations uh, and different ones and you all have that in, in the report and 20% of the allegations were sustained as I indicated previously. Um, of the sustained allegations um, and again we had to, there's a cutoff point because things change every day but the cutoff point was sometime in April uh, where we had sustained and uh, as you see the sustained one it's a little bit hard to see on this map but out of um, how many about on the sustained complaints? Yeah, I can. The green ones. The green ones? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it didn't. Okay. So, a lot on judgment, uh, unsatisfactory performance, the vehicle pursuits. We had eight sustained. Um, I think that was almost one vehicle pursuit. We ha actually had a use of force. Uh, a forcible vehicle stop on a sustained complaint um, and um, and so again uh, we're not afraid to make those kinds of decisions <laughs> and those kind of recommendations on that uh, this were this is all the disciplines that were handed out uh, during 2010 the ordinance authorizes us to report the statistics uh, and not comment about uh, anything in particular so these were for the 27% that were sustained, the discipline for those. This is a documented counseling, mean? Kind of counseling? Documented? Oh, I wish I could give a good answer to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose I could go anywhere from scolding to positive reinforcement and feedback, but it's something that's kept on their record um, longer than a coaching thing. So they're in order there. Um, that's and I, I guess a, a better example, and like an oral reprimand, is probably more is how I would describe it. But this is how they describe it in their contract. So and you make a note that it happened. As well. Yes, That's yeah, it does go in their file. Yes, and the IPRO system keeps these things for as long as the system's in there. So, but that's the primary discipline on these issues. Um, the service complaints by categories, um, service level, performance were the two primary ones. Um, a lot of folks are unhappy when they call police and uh, on a particular crime or something, then it, they're told to either report that they can only take that over the phone or it might take se officers several hours or even several days to get out there and do an investigation. But that was our service complaints by um, subcategory. Um, if uh, one or two use of force is usually a tight handcuff that doesn't cause injury. Um, so that's how we uh, we classified that as a service complaint. <coughs> Handcuffs are going to hurt pretty much all the time. So, um, but we do take a look at that um, by sub category um, conduct uh, courtesy, and this is over a three-year period. Uh, disputed facts uh, again, the performance things and service level. Those again are primarily on response times. We also get a lot of folks who are dissatisfied on domestic violence calls one side or the other is not happy with the decision that the officers make it's just the nature of that type of call um, and so we do get numerous complaints about folks of either they that they were arrested or they weren't arrested or they didn't listen to my side of the story or they only took his side of the story and not my side of the story or he shouldn't have been there in the first place those kinds of things they can be the, some of the most dangerous calls and most volatile calls, but um, uh, 
for an I wouldn't want to be an officer in the middle of those kinds of situations because it's just it's difficult to get a resolution to that in the heat of the moment for those kinds of calls so we get our share of those and um, and I think clearly that that's going to continue um, for the things we talked about when I first came here some of the things that we talked about were the driving complaints and the traffic stops in terms of uh, service complaints and response time actually uh, where either service level or, or officer did not follow a report those have dropped pretty significantly so again that's a performance related issue that we're trying to address um, uh, folks really uh, pay attention to how our officers drive and <laughs> let us know about it when they're not happy and so uh, um, we do get those but they seem less and quite honestly um, the day of the shooting um, there there was a lot of vehicular traffic uh, that was trying to respond to the scene that we got some complaints about and and we dealt with those but understandable on on a on a code three but nevertheless uh, folks still noticed and so um, we tried to address those uh, what again going back to the service complaint surveys which is a number I'm proud of because we're when we're hearing back from people 88% um, well actually 95% thought that we were uh, agreed that we were helpful or uh, or agreed somewhat that we were helpful so I was pleased about that um, and again I go back to supervisor listen to concerns 79% agreed or somewhat agreed address concerns 76 percent agreed or somewhat agreed which again is equivalent to the number that Denver success rate for mediation and then same with the overall satisfaction with outcomes um, for some folks if if you're not gonna waive their ticket or things like that then they're not necessarily going to be satisfied with the outcome but I was really pleasantly surprised um, with these numbers and I hope we get a higher percentage return rate but uh, uh, even with the 20% return rate I think that does give us a snapshot of at least people are understanding what we're trying to do we're trying not to give people false hope uh, sometimes we don't always tell them what they want to hear but by the same token we don't give them false hope we let them know where the other avenues are might be their attorney might be something that has to be dealt with in court all those agencies have to be working well as well um, for people to be satisfied but I, I, I'm very pleased with this number quite honestly uh, policy complaints and inquiries we talked about those uh, again vehicle accidents and pursuits on a decline very pleased about that hope it continues uh, again some of the officers not happy that I pay attention to vehicle pursuits but I do uh, because they kill a lot more people per year than a taser does and so it's very important to me that we address those kinds of things and uh, again vehicle accidents um, maybe the pillars are a little smaller this year down below City Hall um, and uh, <laughs> we had a lot of vehicle accidents where they backed into the pillars uh, <laughs> so maybe they're a little smaller this year I don't know but it's still uh, for all the miles that they put on their vehicles <laughs> every year uh, um, I think that that's now. a good number so and again a lot of that supervision where the supervisors are addressing those things uh, accommodations were down there's still kind of a trend upward um, I, I'm always kind of surprised by accommodations because we've all worked in government long enough to know that when people are happy we don't normally hear from them uh, and when they're unhappy we hear from them a lot so uh, I think it's uh, trending about the way it's always been trending and I think this year it'll probably trend as well and, and about the same but it is always good to hear from folks when they do get good service uh, and um, we hope that continues I think it's like, it's like more commendations and complaints yes not a lot more but yes um, and again our complaints run from um, the officer changed lanes twice without signaling to um, they wouldn't arrest the projectionist at the movie theater because they were playing the movie too loud I swear um, and 
to to uses of force and search and seizure issues and going into people's home and of course we also looked at the major incident involving the officer involved shootings so um, they really run the gamut I think that um, we're very attentive to folks who um, have struggled in life whether they're homeless right now or transient um, those who are suffering permanent or temporary mental diminished mental capacity I think we try to be very attentive to those things in terms of doing the investigations those things maybe that's why they stand out a little bit more in the cases but I think that um, we try to be attentive uh, as we can and then as, as you see as best as we can do from a transparency standpoint is we list every complaint and every service complaint and every disposition on those tables in the back so and we try to summarize them so that people understand what happened and um, I think in, uh, within the confines of the Oregon Public Records Law, I think that we do a pretty good job of talking about every case that we do. So it's a manageable level. So I'm ready for questions. Just for the sake of people who are uh, listening to this, I just want to um, briefly reiterate the mission of your department. And, um, to provide an accessible, safe, impartial, and responsive intake system for complaints against Eugene Police Department employees, and to ensure accountability, fairness, transparency, and trust in the complaint system. And the purpose of our police auditor has three broad mandates. One is to receive and classify complaints of police misconduct, which we saw here. Another is to audit the investigations based on those complaints and three, to analyze trends and recommend improvements to police services in the city, um, in addition supporting the Civilian Review Board. But I, the um, thing that I want to say that I appreciate is I think you've been really working hard at um, doing all of these and analyzing the trends and really trying to pay attention to things where we see um, a trend that we need to try to turn the other way. So just want to to say that for the folks who are listening because sometimes I think people forget what the, the mission and the purpose is of the office. It seems important. Andrea and then Chris. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mark. Uh, very good report. Um, it was, it, I don't want to say it was entertaining, but it caused me to chuckle a couple times of some of the complaints that were unfounded. You're right, somebody complaining about the movie being too loud. So um, I have some questions, not necessarily about the report, but just kind of overall if, um, so, you know, feel free to answer them or get back to me, or if you don't think it's within your jurisdiction, feel free to just say, talk to the chief about that. So the downtown safety zone, last year when we had this discussion and when we were talking about um, allowing it to continue to have life, there was a lot of concern about the community members that would be affected by there, and I was affected by it. Um, the enforcement of the zone and I was wondering if you saw um, any kind of trends um, from from that particular um, direction from council I'm curious about um, the lawsuit with the previous auditor we had heard there was some newspaper articles a while back about her possibly litigating and that was all we all heard um, so and I think the mayor spoke to it that um, identifying trends is one of your one of your charges. And so is that IPRO is that what is able to to um, help you with those identification markers? And then also just kind of on the outskirts, and, and this might be where you might tell me to go talk to the chief. Um, so you know we've been hearing about these gang issues, and I'm just curious about what policies are are in place because I think that there's an opportunity for people to be, um, I wouldn't want to use the word profile, but I can't think of any other word. Um, I mean, I've, I know they've identified some folks in the community that, that, are, that have aligned themselves to be gang members, and I'm sure that there's other people in the out, out in the community that could possibly be mistaken for gang <coughs> members. And so I'm just kind of curious if that training is in policy or if, is it just, you know, what they've decided. I mean, I, I'm assuming there's a policy for it, and so I just kind of want to get your hit on it. Okay, on the, uh, the trend on the downtown exclusion zone, I, I haven't noticed any upward trend in complaints. Uh, the only thing I, I, I do know is that um, uh, Judge Allen has told me um, that 
when the officers are preparing the reports about people that they think ought, ought to or that fit in this category that the reports have, are, are far improved and gives him far more information than they have in the past. So that's the feedback that I've got from Judge Allen and it's easier for him to make a decision. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, f usually the, those folks are involved in more um, um, criminal activity so we don't get a lot of complaints from people who are involved in, in more of the higher profile criminal activity. But um, that's the one thing that I've heard about. Um, can't comment about the lawsuit. Can't okay. comment about the lawsuit. Okay. So, um, um, it exists. It exists. Okay. Uh, that's all I was needing yeah, for it. Yeah, it still exists. Okay. And uh, on the gang issues, uh, we haven't had very many complaints. My opinion is that they're under resourced in dealing with that issue. And as a result of that, um, I don't think they pay attention to people that they shouldn't be paying attention to just because they don't have resources to pay attention to people that they shouldn't pay attention to. Um, and uh, we have gotten a few complaints lately, but uh, it's not a good idea if you're a member of a gang to bring attention to yourself through a complaints process or whatever so um, I really don't ever expect an uptick in in complaints from people who are involved in gangs but we're starting to see a little bit more I, I, th I don't think I don't think people recognize I'm starting to recognize in my neighborhood after Officer Harvey gave the presentation for all the symbols and the writings and things like that. Um, uh, I'm starting to recognize those things, and I'm recognizing them more in the city. I think I'm like Dr. Fonis at the CRB meeting wished that he had never heard about all this stuff. Um, but people need to understand that it is occurring, and even though there's kids involved, it, virtually all the time they have handlers, and the handlers might not even be local. Uh, but you can be assured that that there's an enterprise there, and um, and I don't see any improvement in it. But we haven't had complaints. We've got a few in the last several months. But again, typically, that might be from someone filing on behalf of another, and then when the other hears about it, they don't want to ever talk about it because again, your handlers don't want you to have publicity. So um, I, I really don't expect any change from that. Chris, you're next. Thanks. Um, I really appreciate the report. Very, very good report. Very thorough. Uh, you gave me just a, a wealth of information and a couple of reactions to it. Uh, I looked at the 32 complaints that have been sustained. You know, I kind of counted what was there. And, and that 32 matches a 27 percent if you're looking at the, the 119 that you have on this piece of paper. Um, and so if I do some quick math, um, if you look at that as a percent of all of the complaints that we received, um, or if you look at that as a, as, a, as a percent of all of the interactions, uh, you talked about citations that generate, you know, no use of, you know, arrests and citations, 14,626. That's less than a quarter of a percent that result in a sustained finding. I think if you have less than a quarter of one percent of these interactions resulting in a sustained complaint, we're moving in the right direction. I mean, if you considered it as a percent of all the complaints, regardless, it's still a half a percent. It's, it's a minuscule amount. So that gets to my point about are we moving in the right direction? Are we doing what I hoped the auditor's office would do? Um, and I think for me, it, it's absolutely yes. And for the, all the reasons the mayor cited, are we making progress in all three of those areas? And I can say unequivocally, yes, we are. And I think for me, on the long term, the third one is the most important because that's the one where you really achieve long-term sustained um, benefit is you have a department that is functioning at, a, at an effective level. It's not getting complaints in the first place. It's improving and um, streamlining its processes so that things go well. That's the goal I wanted to get to. Not to be a confrontation where we're fighting over what's happening. We're making things better. And I think that's what your report is really pointing out for me is we are at a very small percent that are sustained complaints, and even then, we're still working on making the process better. 
And so when you look at this algorithm up here that looks like a spider's web of all these things going around, I appreciate how complex that is. But at the same time, I think maybe that's something that you have to have in place in order to have a robust system, one that can sustain a lot of different kinds of inputs from a lot of different directions. Because if it was just a very simple one line, that's easy to snip at any point. But because we have, albeit a complex system, <laughs> But it's also one that I see as also being very robust. It has a lot of either um, alternate paths, redundancies, input opportunities. And I think maybe for us in Eugene, that's maybe what we need to have to get to the outcome that I think you have achieved. So congratulations. I think you've done a really good job so far. I'm really pleased this report points that out for me. And um, keep up the good work. Thank you. Well, and I think the other thing, too, that I tried to emphasize in the report is I still think that there's a ways to go in building relationships in those chance encounters and I know George works for TSA and and just a simple thing of going through the airport is the first person I had contact with did his job but was cold and impersonal 30 feet away the next person I contacted in that process was warm responsive um, Interest, seemed interested in me and my well-being and that was just 30 feet apart and you, as you can imagine that experience was so different and I think that's where we need to go our officers are, are sort of the first line representative for us out on the streets they're the ones in the uniform they're easily recognized like the flight attendant you get on a plane and the flight attendant says hello how are you how's your day you feel better about your flight if you get on the plane the flight says not the flight attendant says nothing to you you walk on the plane here, uh, uh, yeah, he, he or her, they both are doing their jobs. But it's that interpersonal um, interaction that I think um, we have to ingrain, not only just in our police officers, but in all of our employees. And I think we still, I, I think we have a ways to go, and I think management understands that. Um, but, and, and I think everybody's or a lot of folks are understanding that but we have to we have to have everybody understand that the chief and I after I talked to him about that and we walked down to my office and he probably said hello to 10 or 12 people and every one of them was stunned um, that he reached out and said hello to him and it, 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 me it was just a great example of how we all should be in our interactions and and Chris Kilcullen was uh, the the epitome of that type of interaction I recognize that they deal with some very dangerous people and you have to be firm and things like that but the study that I cited in 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 my annual report by uh, Professor Tyler indicates that um, there's no factual basis <laughs> for being hardcore with people versus having a more personable approach in in arrests and again uh, Chris really epitomized that and he got a lot of commendations for his performance being the top performing officer in particular months so I think that's still the direction that we need to go to be one of the top police departments in the nation I've got um, Pat and then Mike and then George I just want to say something about what you just said before I call on Pat because to me it's more than just good communication or being nice it's really service it's really about the service that we're providing and part of that service is that contact and so I think it I think it um, having a good contact with the public is part of the service that we all need to provide no matter where we are in um, provision of services <coughs> in the city and no one's any different from anyone else in that mm -hmm. uh, Pat you're next you know, that, that is absolutely true. Uh, in, in the past, I developed training programs for, uh, well, for Jerry's among others, and one of the things that I always stressed was that even if you don't know the answer to the question that somebody's asking you, if you're, you look them in the eyes and you're friendly and, and personable, then odds are you're going to have a positive interaction. And that's what you're describing is just positive interactions at, 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 across the board. And I agree with what Councilor Pryor has to say. It's just, it's remarkable. You just don't see that in, uh, you know, whatever your line of business may be, particularly one as difficult as, uh, as policing. Um, I do have a question regarding the algorithm, mm -hmm. um, which looks pretty complex and lots of, uh, lots of lines all around, but there is one snip point. Uh, there's one point where everything comes together and it's, uh, that's at the complaint classification point which uh, I was wondering if we could talk if you could talk about that ever so briefly just where is a complaint 
classification point, I'm assuming it's you, and where, you know, how, how does that how does that happen to make sure that one of these five outcomes of that is the right outcome? As part of the legislation, that was the authority granted to me um, by council. Um, I know at times that the CRB is not necessarily, or members of the CRB aren't necessarily pleased with the way I classify a complaint. Uh, I know other um, folks in other uh, commissions and agencies aren't that way. I try to be consistent in making subjective decisions. I try to look at, at the facts and and the weight of the facts, the level of <coughs> contact, perhaps the level of injury, uh, the type of incident, all those kinds of things, and come up with a decision about whether it's an allegation that goes to an internal affairs investigation, whether it's a service complaint that a supervisor tries to uh, get agreement with the complainant about some of the issues that were involved or even address some some performance issues with an officer or an inquiry where I just need more answers to questions because I have some limitations in terms of the labor agreement in terms of, of, of taking action within a specific time frame when I do receive a complaint so if I'm not real sure or I'm not happy with the information that I have at that point in time then that's going to occur or a policy complaint, as I said, is where an officer might take an action that is either trained or part of the policy, even though a person complains about how it occurred. Um, and so, again, and that's party patrol and the, the noise ordinance kind of thing is, is probably where we get most of those kinds of things. And then, as you can see, as, as, as things evolve, it might get <laughs> kick back up there to get re reclassified for example if we initially classify as a, something as a criminal allegation and it's determined either through the investigative process and after consultation with the at uh, district attorney or uh, rarely the city prosecutor they say no no crime occurred then we have to go back up again into a process of okay um, now how do we look at this? Do we look at as an allegation, a more serious complaint that internal affairs should look at, or something that a sergeant should should deal with? Or there's just no evidence for it to go any further. So um, I have that authority based on my 25 years of experience. I don't like being authoritative, um, but it's one of the responsibilities of the job and and so I, I I accept that responsibility and I think again I think one of the outcomes of that is we are getting timeliness I imagine if if others weighed in on how a, a case would be classified and the debate that would occur as a result of that and then the time frames that would be involved to get to where you want to go mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I, I offer to the CRB at any point in time that they can look at any of the cases and ask me why I made a decision in a particular case, and that's about the best I can do. You know, anytime one particular point in the cycle is where everything upstream and downstream goes through that one point, that's the potential for choking, slowing down, and really um, causing the greatest uh, judgment errors. Clearly, we have a police auditor who is skilled at handling that one particular point, and congratulations to you for that. Thank you for the explanation. Thank you. Like Pat, like Chris and others have said, I uh, certainly appreciate your work. Uh, good job. I appreciate the report. It is, in fact, filled with, a, with a, an abundance of good information about this time, and so I appreciate the effort that's gone into making sure that it's clear and concise and helpful for us to evaluate. Um, I also want to say how much I appreciate the work that you've done and your staff's done and the folks on the CRB as somebody on the police commission to to kind of streamline and coordinate that communication and that cooperation with the police commission when it comes to the opportunities for a difficult situation or perhaps a complaint to start a process that leads to policy review and leads to the the job being done better and, and opening that communication for us to evaluate policies that are are potentially in in uh, that are opportunities for improvement so I, I really appreciate that um, one of the things that An Andrea asked about intrigued me um, with regard to the downtown public safety zone when we did the initial two-year review on that, I remember asking you how many complaints you'd received on it and, and having you told me that 
in the first couple of years you, you hadn't received any, that you'd received none. And so um, when, when you mentioned to her that there, there hadn't been an uptick, I'm wondering, have you to this point had any at all yet? Um, there's, there's a few that uh, where the, the line between LTD and EPD exists because LTD has trespassed people as well. Uh, and so then they'll normally call officers. Um, apparently, uh, at least on one complaint, is if the sheriff's department <coughs> issues a check for someone for funds that they had in in the sheriff's department, apparently the U.S. Bank right across the street mm. from your office is the only bank that cashes those checks, <laughs> and it happens to be in the exclusion zone. Right. At least that's what the person told me. So uh, we did get a, a, a complaint about that, but... Uh, again, it, it, it's pretty rare. Um, okay. If, if again, a few, but but nothing that I would uh, call any sort of issue at all that shows up. All right. Thank you, sir, very much. George. Well, Mark, other than your diagram, I, I think it was an excellent report. <laughs> easy to read. <laughs> easy to understand. That's Leah's diagram. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I, I had LASIK surgery done you know, 11 years ago, but, boy, that was a real test on my eyesight on that one. Um, you know, I have to agree with the comments, particularly what Chris said about the, the progress that you've made in the office and in, in how the statistics are starting to, to play out. Uh, as far as, you know, carrying out the mission of the, the, the office of the police auditor, I, you know, you're following it right to the T from the, the time you came in, made some adjustments. Uh, made some hires. I think you know it's it's definitely headed in the right way. I think as a result of the work, uh, you know, there's been a lot of cooperation and relationships built, not only between the auditor and the community, but also the police department as a whole, and the police union, and the citizens. And you know, when the, the, the discussion of the police auditor first started coming around, we used to have a filled gallery of citizens watching. So. To me, looking at tonight's turnout, uh, and I appreciate the people that did come, uh, it, it just it just verifies the fact that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. The office is is doing what it's supposed to be doing, and it's working. You know, we're not we're not hearing the rumblings from the citizen about about the 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 way the office is being run. We're not hearing rumblings from the the, the police officers and their union. So to me, I think we're definitely on the right track, and and I appreciate all the hard work that everybody's done on this. Well, I think we've tried to set clear expectations. Uh, first of all, um, we're we're going to have more problematic incidents. It's just the nature of civilization. Um, but I think another thing that works very well for us uh, compared to some other agencies and some other structures both in this country and around the world is we also have that, if you will, nimbleness to address something and uh, address it quickly and get it taken care of and get the information out there. It's not taken us two or three or four years to do these investigations. I think one of the things that um, on the Van Orem case was that was just a belabored investigation and there's no reason that it needed to be a belabored investigation but it just left all the plates spinning uh, for too long and so when something happens we're, we get out there we get on it uh, the investigation's done, and we come to our conclusions, and whether people agree or disagree with us, uh, the fact of the matter is that it's done in a very timely manner. And, and again, that's something that um, uh, is one of the reasons, I think, um, that um, the model is working. And um, I think that the public appreciates the fact that these things don't linger on, again, given the limitations that we have that uh, in terms of public records that we try to get as much information as possible. And we do have the CRB, which does have an opportunity to look at any of the complaints that we have, any of the information at any time. So they can choose anything they want to look at. And so um, I think maybe the, the next thing that we have to address is to get the public to understand, because and the mayor had mentioned it, uh, 
previously, the independent auditor, is, is quite honestly people still think th that we're part of the police department. Um, that our funding might come from the police department or our staffing or decisions and we are completely independent from the police department and uh, I think the police department folks would, would be the first to say that uh, but we have to get that message out to the community better certainly but we are not in no way shape or form to our millions of viewers out there um, part of the police department well, and the other thing I'd like to comment on is on the fact that we can or your office can get through these in an average of 79 days. Having been on both sides of, of uh, internal investigations, the object of one in running them, um, I know what kind of stress and added worry it adds to not only the officer or officers involved, but the entire department because word spreads and people are wondering well what did you know what happened what's the outcome what's going to happen so it's it's good not only for your office to clear these in, in a fair and impartial way but it's also good for the department and the individuals involved as well as the person who filed the complaint to find out you know the the ultimate outcome of this get that cleared off the plate so people can concentrate back on the job that they're supposed to be doing. So it is important that you, you handle those and this, it, it, you know, the way you've been doing it. The thing that made me mad about this more than anything, it only took her a couple hours to do it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you brought up the uh, domestic violence issues and my um, um, comment is that, that I would I hear about that so often that I would like to be assured that we have the kind of training and, um, and the performance standards around um, domestic violence cases that we need to have. And so I don't know what how you intersect with, with that, but it is uh, certainly something that I would want to be sure we we really know how to do because I know how difficult they are. They're part of the officers and they're just difficult. So we want to be sure we. Um, have the best <coughs> training and ability to deal with them possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know with the chief having everybody getting CIT training has been helpful. Um, they try to have more than one officer respond as, as cover officer. They're just extraordinarily dangerous um, uh, situations. Those and quite honestly just what starts out as a benign traffic stop is, as we've seen um, are extraordinarily dangerous. So um, I, I wish a counselor could go on every one of these runs, but they're, they're very charged, difficult incidents, and it, and it seems to be um, seems to be getting worse just because the economy's bad and tensions are higher as a result of that. And then again, um, we have a long rainy season, and um, when folks are cooped up, um, that's also a social factor in some of these things. So. But I think it's a very good point and something that I think we should probably evaluate in terms of um, how those are handled. We, we rarely have violence between officers and, and the parties in these situations. Um, they're usually there post fact, but it is something I think that um, ought to probably take a look at again. And what proportion of complaints do you have around things like uh, traffic tickets? Um, less than 50 probably, but nobody's happy about traffic tickets. And w one of the things that we've worked on is, is, is if we got several complaints from officers on traffic stops, it was what we found often was that the officer might be a little argumentative with the person and so they developed a program where each night the sergeant would go over the ICB and traffic stops with the officer to, to ensure that it's there's less argument there. Again, no one's happy about getting a traffic ticket, but we don't need our employees to argue with the person about whether or not they thought that they were guilty or innocent. So actually the number has dropped to 29 and, and it really worked well with this officer and we haven't got a complaint from him for quite some time. Um, and so we're pleased about trying to make those interactions as positive that, as they can be. The other part of it is, is, is at least initially before they go to court, some of these fines are like two hundred and sixty dollars for rolling through a crosswalk or a stop sign, and I'd be a little angry too. Um, 
and uh, that's a lot of money. And so I think that that when they see that two hundred and sixty dollar ticket, um, they're displeased. And again, if you don't have a long traffic record, they're usually mitigated. The fines are mitigated by the judge, but the officer doesn't have the leeway to do that. But sometimes people, <coughs> and I can even see a fine of 50 or $100 or something, but you get a ticket for $260 for rolling through a stop sign when there's no traffic, I'm not going to be very happy either. So that's that. we are noticing that every now and then. Final comment is just uh, it seems to me the usefulness of your report is if we are really careful that we measure apples and apples over time so that we really know that we're seeing um, what's what's happening. So we've got to be very, very careful that in, in how we measure that we get an accurate picture. So. Well, that's why I try to pick and choose in terms of comparisons with other agencies. I try to pick and choose agencies that do similar reports and um, also ones that have uh, typically on the oversight side of it vigorous oversight system <coughs> Cincinnati has a vigorous oversight system for example uh, LA about as vigorous as you can get uh, San Francisco um, and so and Berkeley so that's some of this one of the reasons that I pull those out as compared to some other places that have I think fairly weak or um, less than vigorous models I, I really have to su salute the city of Eugene the council the city manager for the support of a very vigorous model of oversight for a city this time this size I, I think it's an investment but um, uh, certainly we have far less problems and in fact I go to Canada next week to talk about our system on an international panel so there'll be a professor there from China and me and uh, I'm thinking she's probably gonna have more interesting things to say than me but the model that we have in place is starting to get noticed by other cities is one that's um, uh, reasonable from a resource standpoint and still thorough and uh, fair and unbiased <coughs> from an investigative standpoint. Anybody else have any questions? Other than that, I think we, uh, unless you have anything else you want oh, to share no, with us. Oh, no, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for your time. And, uh, that ends our um, work session. You know, Mark, the week after our birth became a Eugene City.